And welcome to a neuroscience episode of the Click Nation's Comic Book Chronicles. I am your host, Tim D-O-double-G. And the man behind the sound effects you hear is my co-host, Agent underscore 70 on Twitter. What's up, what's up? And we are here tonight to discuss comic books, of course. And today marks off the beginning of San Diego Comic Con, which is a big comic book and cartoon and TV and movie and toys and everything, entertainment and media event, which is taking place in San Diego, yeah, California. Yeah, it's a big deal. Pretty big deal. So even though today is the first day, we will uh, discuss some of the, the news that was released today. And, of course, we'll also be talking about this week's new comic book releases. But first, some time for some plug-in. Make sure to go to the website, theclicknation.com. There you can find the previous episodes of the Comic Book Chronicles and uh, comic book reviews by myself and other reviewers on the site. Shout-outs to at Coates Villain on Twitter. He's been doing some of the Valiant reviews, so give some of his uh, reviews a read. Make sure to comment on them. Follow the Twitter account at the Click Nation. Make sure to like our Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash the Click Nation. Find us on Google Plus. Just search for the Click Nation to find the page. Add it to your circles. Also, make sure to join the Click Nation community. Just search for the Click Nation community. We're on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. YouTube.com slash the Click Nation. And if you ever have some feedback you want to have read on a future show, send that on over to the Click Nation at gmail.com. And with all that out of the way, Yay. we are going to discuss some of this comic book news from the, at least the last seven days. There's a it, massive amount. Some of it goes back to last Friday, which would have been after the day we recorded. Right. Oh, it's like the pre priming the pump for uh, San Diego. Yes, sir. As I try to plug, let people know we're live now online. <clears throat> So, let's see. Let me bring up news. First bit of news is supposedly X-Force and Magneto movies were confirmed by Rob Liefeld. Wow. That's just... I don't know what to, what to do with the clap or to, 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 to cash register that. Cash register, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Because I'm not so sure I want to clap for that, you know, for that news. Honestly, it's, you know, considering clap the board. Fox... The Fox track record? I don't know. Yeah, that's the, the one that's downside the is, especially with all this news coming out from, uh, like, I'll, they keep releasing this, you know, news from... The Wolverine? The, yeah, well, uh, Days of Future Past is what I'm trying to say. Oh, okay. Like, every day it's a new image leaked by Mark Millar, or Miller, however you spell, uh, pronounce his name. So, you, uh, and then... They're jamming so many characters into this storyline. It's like a lot of these characters and mutants are just going to be background characters. It's weird. You'd think they were doing, you know, they're they're jamming this many characters in there for like toy placement, you know, for a character, you know, introducing the character. I wonder if they're just not doing this just so that Marvel Studios won't be able to get their hands on some of these characters if they like cross over into Avengers, you know, territory. I don't know. It just seems. Uh, you know, it seems like it's uh, a bit much. It's it's over. It's definitely overkill. Right. Yeah, it's definitely the hey, let's try to get some toys out of this. Yeah, but you don't see. Yeah, but but the but, but my problem with that is you don't see them. You know, like if you ever like <laughs> you know, listen. You know, this is another uh, podcast. Of, you know, like uh, uh, discussing the the down the downturn in uh, Toys R Us and just walking through the toy aisle. You know, like you go like at random, like on a, on on any day, and it's just you can't, you know, you don't. There's not much out there anymore. 
it's 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 you know the pickings are pretty slim. You know, yeah, even and with the uh, even with the movie tie-in, so. And even taking it back to X Force, as hopefully we've got our man Dirt joining us. We'll see, we'll see if he's ready just yet. But to finish my statement, uh, taking it back to X Force, it, my question is: Which version of X Force? Are we going to see? Is it going to be the original, like sort of like the very first original team that spun out of New Mutants, or is it going to be sort of the Rick Remender, Uncanny X Force squad, you know, having Wolverine and Deadpool involved? Knowing the movie industry, it's going to be a mix. It's going to be they're going to meld them together yes. somehow. I can see like Cable being on it, Deadpool, just because they had their own book at one time, and then right. having like offshoot characters like maybe Cannonball get his movie appearance, but then. Sure. Someone that hasn't even been on X Force before, like uh, oh, I'm trying to think of a Pitsy or something like that. Well, I mean, you know, if you go back to like the original like X Force run, you're gonna see like Richter and Shatterstar and. Uh, see, that's who I'd like to see. You know, um, Boom Boom. I'm old, I'm old school know? X Force. Yeah, I yeah. Me, give me Sunspot and Cannonball and some Warpath. Well, you know, now they cross over into Avengers territory, so that's gonna be interesting to see who puts them out first. You know, I, I need some Warpath in the comic book. I, I would shout outs to Sam Humphreys for getting, I think it was Sam Humphreys. No, Dan, for, uh, shout outs to Dennis Hopeless for getting Boom Boom into Cable and Edge Force. Now I want some Warpath, who actually probably wouldn't fit since they already have the Strong Man and Colossus. Yeah, you but there, then, Dirt? I don't know, am I? Yes, you are. I don't I know hear you. My, my video is not working. I don't know why. You just don't want to show us your. Your uh, trimmed beard. Uh, you trimmed beard? your beard? The beard may be uh, trimmed, but the hair is not. I'm getting <laughs> shaggy on top. Uh, I don't know if it's the webcam, but it's not showing up. Well, we can hear you, so. Well, yeah, but you can't see my beautiful face. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, as long as you're able to add the, well, the cover. All the visual gags that we yeah, have. All the, all the covers once we get into the, this week's right. books. That's well, all that matters. See. Let me see if those will pop up here real quick. Let me uh, find the <laughs> folder. Uh, let's start with the book here. Pull that up. Get the app. And the screen share. Boy, everything's running kind of slow tonight. Uh, is that working? Yes. It is. Okay. Well, I can still do that at least, I guess. Sweet. Yeah, we'll just blame this on me trying to get this all get, uh this uh, operation running at the last minute since I was eating dinner late. Yeah, what's up with that? Yeah, and I didn't even create the event till like after nine. And yeah, well, I was sitting there earlier today, going, "Well, I guess he's not doing it because I haven't gotten anything." Yeah, I just, I actually had time at work too to go ahead and do it. I was just kind of being lazy. Oh, I say, well, I'm doing work. Mm-hmm. Go figure. I saw the, t- I saw the tweet, and I was like, "Oh, I guess I better log in." <laughs> <laughs> And I, I didn't send uh, Dirt the when I sent the invite to Agent Seventy. I didn't include Dirt because I just figured he might have been busy today. And then I didn't see your uh, the green line under your Google contact name, so I didn't think you were online. Uh, you know what? My my phone and my tablet are always online, regardless of <laughs> if I'm paying attention or not. Yeah, same here. But thanks for joining us this week. Yeah, definitely. We were talking about uh, the X Force and supposed Magneto movies. <laughs> and that's Dirt's uh, two cents on the subject. You know, I mean, it's like uh, with with all of those X Men movies, it's like uh, the first one I thought was pretty good, and then they did the second one, I thought that was really cool, and then the third one, I was like, I never want to see one of these again. And then uh, they did the then Wolverine one that was okay, and then they did the uh, first class that I thought was all right, but didn't seem like it was anything all that special to me, and then. I don't know. It's like they just keep making more, and they've got like what four more planned, five more planned, something. It's just like it's getting to the point where it's just like I don't, I don't care enough. Like I'll watch them when they come out on video or whatever, but <laughs> I'm just not, I'm not dying to see them, you know. That's exactly what I was just saying, Dirt. Um, welcome back, by the way. Oh. Um, you. I was just saying that uh, you know I just don't trust Fox's track record now. They don't give me any reason to have any kind of hope that, you know, an X-Force movie is going to work. Well, and also, especially, like, if you've read the uh, official synopsis of the movie, 
The official synopsis of Days of Future Past says that Kitty Pride uses her mutant powers <laughs> to fling her and Wolverine into the past, and it's like, wait, what? Really, what? Yeah, I oh, heard that today. Goodness. Today was my first time hearing that. Wait, that came out in San Diego? Wow. Well, well actually, that was... It came uh, out on a comic book blog, I heard. Yeah, uh, let me see if I can pull it up here real fast. Um, days of Future Past... I like to sing when I type. It goes better. You have a keyboard way. for your tablet? Oh, I'm on my my uh, desktop right now. I was in the other room with the tablet. Oh, does that? Oh, that's out. Chrome you have open. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, you have a bunch of apps on there, but I forgot Chrome puts a little page with all your apps if you want it. Yeah, it's actually really handy. <laughs> um, let's see here. Where is the official? <laughs> let's see why you're doing that. And, you know, is Ryan Reynolds still going to be playing Deadpool after all these years? Well, he uh, he actually made some comment in some interview the other day where he said, you know, I'll still do it if they ask me to, but I really don't have much faith in the uh, studio right now. Which, mm. when you say something like that, is a good way to get yourself off the job. You yeah. Know? Like Jeremy Renner and Hawkeye. All right, let's see here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's great. It's riveting, isn't it? Doug is supposed to be out in Comic Con today. <laughs> like, watch me load up a web page. It'll be nice for the audio people. Not me. When they just when they go back uh, and listen in. Hey, do either of you guys have any contacts out in San Diego attending the uh, San Diego convention this weekend? I do not. Dirt? Yeah, I mean, I've got several friends out there. I just nice. I hate traveling. I don't. I don't ever. Go, but but yeah, I've got friends who are out there. Nice. My my usual uh, contact here. that goes out there uh, couldn't make it this year, so I, I'm I'm basically without any kind of uh, source for swag or stuff. What do we got? Let me see if I can. I I don't know. There's so many uh, <laughs> so many so many things that have popped up over the last few days that it's hard to uh, figure out. Here we go. Uh, the official listing says, Kitty uses her powers to send Hugh Jackman's Wolverine back into the past. Wow. That's the official, uh, in quotes, that's the official line from the studio. Oh, that gets a gong. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty disappointing. Yeah, that's about the dumbest thing I, I think I've heard in a long time. Almost about as dumb as uh, Phoenix just deciding to explode uh, Cyclops for no reason. Or Deadpool having his mouth sewn shut. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, that's our not having faith in Fox uh, statement for the episode. More news. Justice League War animated film confirmed for 2014 based Yay. on the, based on the new 52 origin arc. Have you guys watched Flashpoint Paradox yet? It's Is it out yet? It's technically not out, but there's review ways copies to watch are it. out. Exactly. Yeah, well, there's, there's ways to watch it. Yeah, and so uh, I've got a review copy of it, and it's really good. And I watched Ooh. it too. So, <laughs> I, did not. <laughs> I, I did. I, I did see a link for it earlier today, but uh, Dirt knows what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for does, educational purposes. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah. For yeah, for academic review purposes only. Yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, just very quickly on 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 uh, Flashpoint, Tim, you'll 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 see what I mean when you watch it. Mm-hmm. It's it's probably the most Japan anime animation looking. Justice League cartoon I've ever seen, and I don't know how I feel about that yet. From the trailer, I I'm a fan of that art. It looked nice. Yeah, well, one thing that I noticed a lot in this one, more so than I noticed it kind of in uh, Dark Knight Returns, uh, but more in this one is that they add a lot of CGI to it, where right. like Cyborg will pull up a holographic display, and Cyborg is cell animation, and the background is cell animation, and everything he's interacting with is cell animation, but then right in the middle his hologram is CGI. And and I've noticed that blend a lot 
in this one, and I think that's just something that's a lot in you know animation nowadays anyway. Right. Um, but it's not like the whole movie is not CGI. You know, most of it is traditional cell animation, but they just a lot of these effects, um, and sometimes the big vehicles and things like that that pop up are right. CGI on that, and it looks really cool. Um, right. I definitely, I definitely dig the the overall look. It's just that the you know seeing the characters rendered pretty much in a you know in an anime style, yeah. it's kind of it's kind of jarring to see it all you know all at once. I I, I you know everyone who had ever seen you know uh, an episode of Voltron had always thought I wonder what DC would look like in anime style or. Uh, what Marvel would look like in anime style. And to actually see it done, you know, it, it, it takes some time to get used to. And I may have to go back and watch it again just to get an overall feel for it. And I wonder if maybe we should do a, a, a review when Tim finally gets around to watching it. We'll just, you know, we'll, we'll do a quick, a, a quick segment on it. Well, Marvel has done anime uh, oh, strict in conjunction. Anime, right. Yeah. And DC with, um, they did a Batman one five years ago, four years ago, that was uh, like six or seven shorts uh, all combined together. Was oh, the, it Gotham ba- Knights? Yeah, Gotham right. Knights. Yeah, and, and those were anime. So, although, you know, each one was a different style of anime. This is a more traditional type anime style. Exactly. But, but yeah, I, I, mean, I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, when they announced it, I remember saying, uh, you know, this is great because if this opens it up, you know, where they set up the new 52s and they have all the new 52 stories to pull from that they can start animating. And, of course, the next thing they announce is just that they're doing that first new 52 storyline. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. And if this gives them the ability to take, you know, the best story arcs, you know, and pull them together and to start turning these into regular animated features, I'm all for it. Because you know, next up will be Night of Owls. Oh, court, exactly. I was saying Court of Owls. Stuff. Court, what, which what, what is it? Court of Owls and then Night of Owls? Is that the the? Uh, the I don't recall. Came in? Uh, yeah, I, I know don't... Court of Owls is. I think you know is the uh, is the the group, you know, within the comic. But I'm not sure what the type the art title. I think they called Night of Owls like whenever at night where it crossed over into all the other bat titles. I think is what they call that one. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, Court of Owls will be. The next step. I'm trying to think what other stories could they do in the new 52 standpoint. I guess maybe talk about after by the time they do Court of Owls, it'll be like three or four years into it. So maybe they'll have well, Trinity I mean, War or, or, or I, just Elite Dark. Him, I, yeah, I could, I could see them uh, pulling even a Suicide. The first Suicide Squad story uh, could work really well. Uh, the first Death Arc. The, the Green Lantern stuff, too. Um, yeah, although that one's. It's convoluted. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to get into it without all the history, you know, because that one was. It had to go pre New Fifty Two. Or to establish the colors and all that. Um, although technically, I guess Brightest Night or Darkest Night and Brightest Day still happened in the New Fifty Two. We just didn't see it in the New Fifty Two, but they reference it like it already happened. So. Yeah. Um, and all that confusion. Yeah, but like I would love to see the first Deathstroke arc. Because uh, that was great. That was one of the was it? my my happiest uh, things from the New Fifty Two. One was of the that, that was pre that was pre Laffield. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Deathstroke was one of those books. Deathstroke was so good, and then they brought in Liefeld, and it immediately tanked. And then as soon as he left, and they brought in a new writer, it was suddenly great again. Like, it was obviously the problem was Liefeld. If Liefeld hadn't been on that book, then I'm sure it would still be going today. But it dropped so much when Liefeld took over. You know, we had people that would walk into the comic book store, and they had been reading Deathstroke, you know, since day one, and they read the Teen Titans because they want to see the rest of the family, and they got Team 7 and everything else, you know. Uh, they'll get everything Deathstroke, but as soon as they saw that book with Liefeld, they were like, nope, put it back. So, oh yeah, uh, I'm, I'm assuming neither one of you have been, have. Read the Team Seven book, right? No, nope. I read them. Okay, so I guess in that arc or those issues, they were hunting for the uh, Holy Grail. No, they were hunting for uh, Pandora's, the Pandora's box. box. I'm getting. I'm yeah. thinking about Kanye, uh, Jay Z's latest album, <laughs> Holy Grail, Pandora's Box, whatever. <laughs> but but yeah, so they were. Yeah, uh, Team Seven. Box. Team Seven was set in the past. Yeah. 
Uh, so it was several years back, and it was back like Amanda Waller. <coughs> excuse me, Amanda Waller was still uh, just a regular grunt, you know, working in the um, special forces and whatever. She wasn't in her, you know, position. She hadn't gotten blackmail on everybody yet to move up the chain. So it was her past, and it was Deathstroke's past, and uh, Grifter is past. Everybody, you know, together on this team. You know, I'm thinking back to it. I'm, I'm sure the sales probably weren't good for on the book, which is why it was canceled. But that, that seemed like that would be the type of book that they w- would need to keep around, just because it sort of was going to try to fill in the blanks for some of the stuff that happened in the past. Well, it's it was one of those weird books where um, and it included a lot it, of characters that are spread out amongst the universe. Yeah, Blackhawks was kind of the same way, where you had a bunch of characters that weren't necessarily superheroes, but they're in the superhero world. So you did have some interesting interactions in the way that, you know, someone without superpowers, how do they deal as trying to be, you know, the, the special agents, uh, the SEAL Team 6, whatever that you send in. You think these are the guys that are cream of the crop, the Green Berets, you know, these are the top uh, Navy SEALs, Special Forces guys, and then suddenly they're superheroes, you know. It's like how do they deal with suddenly not being that top dog anymore uh, by something they could never even hope to match up to. One of the neat things about Team 7 is that it brought back Majestic. And so Majestic was the... Uh, uh, was he Superman? S- Superman he's analog, yeah. Superman of the... Yeah, of uh, like Wildstorm universe, I guess. Yeah, okay. Um, they brought him back, and the thing was they brought him back, and then the series ended with him going off to do his own thing, which, if the series had continued, I guess you would have found out why there's no Majestic now. And this book was set several years in the past. Oh, so, so it's like, what happened to Majestic? You know? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That, so there's there's a there's a hole in the storyline they have to explain somewhere. There should be an ongoing series that's in the past just to try to fill in the blanks for some of the stuff. I don't care. Well, they what should have just started. In the past? So start from the beginning? Yeah, they should just. But yeah, then they, they, they should have started everything with, uh, like, Batman Zero Year. I love Zero Year. But that's what should have been issue one of the new 52, you know? <laughs> but then you cut, but then you wouldn't be able to uh, keep the continuity for Batman and Green Lantern. Yeah, they, they would have found a way to work around it. I mean, I, they, they definitely, I think they should have done a year of character building where you have that first year of Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, uh, you know, whoever, getting their powers, figuring out what they're doing. They, they kind of bump into each other on the peripherals every once in a while. And then after a year, then boom, it's Justice League time. Bring everybody together into the big mm-hmm. team, you know. Um, instead, we had, you know, these you characters. You couldn't wait that long. Yeah, well, you couldn't wait that long, honestly. I think marketing and, 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 and the bean counters probably got in the way of that, if that was ever even considered. Yeah, and I think that's. I mean, on the one hand, I, I can understand you want to start with a heavy hitter like Justice League that has ev- all the characters together, you know, to do something with. But at the same time, there there were so many questions, and there still are so many questions of what, like, Bane uh, attacked Batman and broke his back at some point. But does that mean Azrael was there? Does that mean Azrael was, you know, Batman for a while, or is that not there anymore? You know, you had Robin. Uh, retconned even after seven months into the new 52, <laughs> they decided he wasn't a Robin anymore. You know what I mean? It's just like they, they didn't have all of that stuff figured out when they decided to, you know, jump through the time stream a little bit. And I can kind of forgive them for that because it is a lot of characters to try to get them situated of where they're going to, you know, put them in the new universe. And I, you know, which is, you know, probably brings up the point what probably would have been better if they had held off until they had everything sort of as finely tuned as possible. But, I mean, I, I still give them credit. It was a super ballsy move. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't that's know. Definitely not, not. Originally, I used to knock them for, oh, this doesn't make sense, and this can't happen in, you know, all this stuff happened in five years, but now it's like, eh, they did something different. I try to give yeah, people credit for doing different, like, Superior Spider-Man. Yeah, there aren't a lot of companies that would sit there and say, okay, we're going to take everything we have and just kind of trash it and start over, you know. Uh, that's it, It's definitely a, 
a big move, and it took a lot of guts to do it. So I give him credit for that. But, you know, I just think it's one of those things that you're going to make that big move. They should have had some of that stuff sorted out a little bit better before they got started. But, you know, I mean, it's comics. The time's going to go by. They're going to have a good idea, and they're just going to say, well, you know, we're we're going to change history to make this new story work because this new story's better, you know. Yeah. And you, you can't get too bogged down with continuity on everything, you know. Um, Marvel has that rubber band continuity, so you know, uh, history in the Marvel Universe is always kind of changing. Now they're saying that uh, Captain America, um, th they're going to start shifting Captain America to being like a, a Vietnam War vet uh, who got frozen instead of a World War II vet, you know, really? because having him as a World War II, II guy is too old, and, you know, all these people that were in his comic back then can't be around anymore, you know, and all this kind of stuff. There have been talks about doing that for maybe two years now. So yeah, it's too late for that now, though. With the movie having come out, you know, establishing pretty firmly uh, in most people's you know minds that he's a World War II vet. They just basically it, he's just frozen longer, you know. So, yeah. Well, or or they say he wasn't thought out until five years ago. Right. You know. Frozen I longer. mean, it's just. Yeah. <laughs> There's just a lot of things that they do where they just kind of ignore a bunch of stuff and just kind of change it on the fly as they go. So, I mean, I don't know. Either way, if, if you if you prefer your rubber band history where uh, it hasn't happened that much or, you know, DC style where they it seems like every so often they pull out an actual calendar and start marking off dates, you know. Um, either way, as long as the stories are coming out that are, are good, you know, and I think both companies have some really good stories going on right now that I'm happy with from both of them, so... You know, I never, I, as much as I make fun of people, like, ah, DC's so much better than Marvel, what are you guys, stupid, blah, 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 whatever. Like, I really, I, I try to stay away from that. Because, you know, who who do you see on the street corner going, man, NBC sitcoms are so much better than CBS's, you're an idiot. You know, that, that doesn't happen. And that shouldn't happen in comics either. It's like changing the channel. You know, if you want to watch Big Bang Theory on one channel and you want to watch... Um, reruns of Seinfeld on some other channel, then, you know, go ahead. Just the same way with comics. If you want to read a Punisher story you're... one day and you want to read a Superman the next, you know, it's switch the dial and get a different story. As long as you're enjoying one of them. Right. Okay. So anyway, all right, so that's, that's the end of my rant. And that's Justice League War, so look for that in 2014. Harley Quinn's going to get her own ongoing series later this year. More, more DC. Another female character getting her solo book going, and it'll be tied into the somewhat tied into the Bat family, I'm sure. So that should maybe keep the sales somewhat uh, steady on it. At least that'll be the hope for DC. And it's going to be written by uh, Jim. Is it written by Palmiotti? Palmiotti and drawn by Amanda Connor. Well, she's co-writing it with him, okay. and I don't, th I don't think an artist has actually been named. People assumed it was Amanda Connor, but... Well, because they, they have a promo piece of artwork out there. I'm pretty sure Amanda Connor did it. Yeah, but they have it listed as co-writer. Uh, okay. Maybe she just did a, the promo art for Comic-Con just to show it off. Yeah, which is nice. I wonder, though, if that means Suicide Squad isn't long for the world. Because she well, was we, kind of the main for that book. I can't remember if we announced it last week or not, but Alex Cott, I think is his name, he just took over writing duties on Suicide Squad, and now he's off of it. Oh, I didn't even hear that one. That came out last... That, I think that came out right after we recorded last week. Yeah. Did he, did he say why? Um, no, he, all he said was he hit his deadlines, and he was knocking it out of the park. And then he quit. Or he didn't say he quit. He's just off the book now. Right. Oh. Maybe maybe what he wrote was terrible. I don't know. Yeah. But well, it's funny because people. Are, well, I mean, I read the first issue, his first issue, where they brought James Gordon Jr. on, and I mean it was. Eh. But everyone else has been loving his. Uh, I'm assuming what two or three issues since he took over. Probably just two because I want to say he just got on the book. But people said they loved it, and now he's off. You know, and it's funny because I have every issue of Suicide Squad, but I don't think I've read it since uh, he came on. No, since Death of the Family. Oh. Like I'm, I'm so many issues behind. It's just one of those things where 
you know, some Saturday when I'm bored, I'll just sit down for four hours and, you know, read the whole run. I just, you know, haven't gotten around to it. That's how the Gambit series is going to be for me once it ends. I'll be like, okay, time to finally read it now. But uh, speaking of other people off books, I didn't actually have this in the news, but I remember reading it yesterday or Monday or earlier in the week. Uh, Justin Jordan is off of Superboy. They say who's bringing it back? Who's coming in? They have not, but it hasn't affected his other work for DC. Uh, they say it was uh, it was editorial differences of why he left, but they haven't announced who's going to take over. Huh. Okay. So there's that. Other news. The only other things I had ran down were, you know, of course today Comic Con started and uh, the images of the Sentinel's head from Days of Future Past were shown. And there was an electro teaser video from Amazing Spider Man 2. I watched the electro one. He, Jimmy Fox kind of looked like a big Smurf. <laughs> and the central head looked look pretty cool. It was like a regular sized head, so people were wondering, you know, was it scaled down or maybe like human sized Sentinel robots? Kinda don't know. We have to wait. Hmm. And we wait with bated breath. Agent. 70, did you, was there any other news you wanted to mention? There's a, there's so much coming out, even though, you know, it's only the first day of San Diego. It's kind of hard to filter through. Um, I, I, since Marvel had their live blogs up, actually, and of course, News Rama had some live blogs going on, so I read some of those. None, the Superior Spider-Man one probably would be worth going through. I haven't actually had a chance to look at it yet. Um, I saw that um, Ethan Van Skyver uh, posted something on Facebook that he is now the ongoing cover artist for Earth 2, I believe it is. Um, that was Brett Booth doing that, right? Since he does every other cover in DC. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> Seems like he has. I like how that I like how that's an announcement. The new cover artist. Well, and it's weird because, uh, you know, I mean, he's a guy that normally does well. Although, wait, I just take let me think about this for a second because uh, he was on the Batman book, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he did uh, Legends Knight. of the Dark Knight, a couple issues of that. But I just remember he also said something on Facebook the other day about how he signed some sort of deal with Robert Kirkman, but he couldn't talk about it yet. And it's going to be some sort of announcement for San Diego. But mm. he said he said he's not leaving D.C. when he made that announcement. He signed a contract with Kirkman. He couldn't talk about it, but he's not leaving D.C. So he's mm. doing some sort of work for Kirkman. So I wonder if him doing covers as a regular gig is because he's going to be doing something else with Image and Kirkman. Whether or not that's he can't do for interiors. Walking. Yeah, I, I like I don't know. Maybe he's going to be doing covers for Invincible from now on too, or something. Or you know, maybe there's another book coming out from uh, Skybound, uh, which is Kirkman's imprint. You know, maybe he's doing something original over there. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but um, but yeah, it is kind of weird that they would make him a a regular cover guy, seeing as how he does do you know regular books, but. Um, yeah. I just thought that was interesting. So I, that's another thing I need to follow up and figure out what he's doing for Kirkman. Okay, that was my first time hearing that. Yeah. Um, you know, at the DC All Access panel, um, there's a Shazam monthly coming in 2014 and maybe a Doom Patrol monthly as well. I'm presuming that the Shazam monthly is going to be coming out of the events of Trinity War, uh, is Gary Frank going to draw it? <laughs> and is Loeb going to write it? Because if, if Gary Frank is going to draw it, then I'll buy it. Like, I don't care who's writing it. Liefeld could be writing it. As long as Gary Frank is drawing it, I'll buy <laughs> it. Well, no I guess he, on that yet. He, he left Green Lantern, so he has an extra book, uh, an extra opening. Because he hasn't taken on any other work, has he? 
Well, maybe so. Because hmm. he's doing the two Justice Leagues. Well, League of America and Justice League. I forget there's a dark out there. So he's doing those two Justice Leagues and Aquaman. And then he had Green Lantern, but he's off that now. So he could fill that gap with uh, Shazam. Yeah. So the yeah, only well, yeah the only the only bar, part of the announcement is that uh, Jeff Johns basically alludes to a Shazam monthly coming in the new year. So no real details. They may be saving uh, the uh, exact announcement for one of the later cons. So we'll see if they announce it at New York. Or <coughs> they have more panels this week. I'm sure maybe they're saving it for one of those. Right. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, well, I, I don't know exactly how this all ties in, but Kirkman. Um, they did some announcement at Comic-Con, and I got an email uh, from Dark Horse, the press release, but Dark Horse press releases are simply, they send out an image, and that's all they send out. There's no you know words to go along with it. Um, and so it's just this image of you see uh, a bloody road, like a highway with a, a spot of blood on it, and it just says dead. And the A in dead is an X. So... Here we so there's something. Uh, this is the tenth anniversary of Walking Dead, so the X would tie in with uh, Roman numeral ten four, years, right? Ten years, but um, but it's a teaser, and there's an announcement uh, tomorrow, um, and then Saturday there's going to be an announcement at the Skybound panel. So, hmm. So there's something going on with the 10th anniversary there. So maybe there's an offshoot book. Maybe there's a secondary book that they're going to bring out for the 10th anniversary. Maybe they'll introduce Daryl. Actually, uh, apparently someone asked Kirkman that, and he said, no, Daryl is never going to be in the comic ever. He's for the TV show. <laughs> All righty. If that's oh. it for... Oh, oh, one thing, um, I did see uh, the uh, solicits. I was going through some of the solicits for, uh, I think it's September, and the um, Forever Evil. I didn't realize this before when I was looking through all the stuff, but apparently, uh, as part of Forever Evil, um, the Justice League uh, is somehow seemingly killed, like all the heroes are dead. I didn't realize that they were supposed to be dead. Uh, and the the teasers are for the uh, crime syndicate uh, coming. So the uh, Ultraman, Superwoman, Owl. Yeah, um, I read that. Uh, Blee and Cool was uh, guessing that the crime syndicate could be coming over. Well, because apparently for um, uh, Teen Titans, Green Lantern, uh, Nightwing, I think uh, those books they have little teaser images out that show. Yeah, uh, the the crime syndicate characters, but you just see like their feet or their silhouette, or you know, it's not like um, huge. Uh, oh, so that's who their those feet those feet are supposed to be for. Yeah, it's like uh, Ultraman and Superwoman. And you know what? That actually just made me think of something because they I think they already said today in uh, one of the early DC panels today, whoever might have been Jeff Johns, but someone from DC said that. Lex Luthor plays a big role in Forever Evil, and I wonder if it's not our Earth Lex Luthor, but the whatever Earth that is, Lex Luthor, who's the hero version. Because isn't he a hero in that whatever universe that the Crime Syndicate yeah. comes from? Yes. Yeah, Lex Luthor is. Yeah, it go tie, it, and then it ties into the uh, Injustice video game. Well, and also the the thing is, uh, if if we want to go ahead and and move into Trinity War for this week. Yeah, we can because um, that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, Justice League of America came out this week, um, and it you know, a little more details of what's going on. One of the characters who it seems like is orchestrating the whole thing is a character that we saw in the um, what was he called? Society of Evil or whatever. They, they've been appearing in Justice League. Secret of America. Society. Yeah, Secret Society. Uh, the guy who's in charge of that was some guy who they had like in a bowler hat, wearing a nice suit, um, all that kind of stuff. Well, it, he appears in um, Justice League. I don't remember if it was in Justice League or if it was in America. Uh, when they're going through the tarot cards, they show him, and he's labeled as the outsider. Uh, that's in America. 
All right, yeah. so in Justice League America, he's labeled as the outsider. Well, the outsider in um, the, like, 60s comics, uh, 70s comics, whatever, in DC, the outsider was Alfred. Um, Alfred took a bump on the head and became Batman's arch nemesis for a while, and he was calling himself the outsider. Well, um, in this book, we've got this guy who has the thin little mustache. He's got the thin, lanky build. He's got that bowler hat like Alfred used to wear. He's got you know. this head shaped like Alfred. Yeah, he looks like Alfred. He knows where to go in the Batcave to get yeah. Well, kryptonite. And that's the, yeah, that's the thing. He's got the chunk of kryptonite. Well, we saw in um, an issue of, I don't remember if it was in Batman or Detective, uh, several months ago, somebody broke into the Batcave. And they put their hand on the hand scanner, and it recognized who they were and granted them access. Mm -hmm. Well, the only people with access are going to be Bruce Wayne and Alfred. So, it, was a, it was an issue of Justice League. Oh, was it Justice League? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this guy is Alfred from another reality. Most likely, he's probably from Earth-3, where the uh, Injustice Society is, or the Crime Syndicate uh, is coming from. And he is part of you know Flashpoint, New 52, whatever... Um, or one way or another, found his way to our Earth. Um, and my guess is, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and make one of my wild predictions that will never come true, but uh, my uh, prediction is that he knows the crime syndicate is coming and that they're powerful and they're almost impossible to stop, so he's trying to build some sort of group to counter them because he knows that they're eventually going to find their way to Earth. So I'm looking at this as... Um, Who's building know, the group? The Outsider. Oh, he's, oh, so he's building the crime, the, the society of evil. Right, he's trying or to build... secret society, whatever yeah, they're called. he's trying to build this super society, and, and either he's either going to control the Justice League or try to destroy them to keep them from getting in his way so that he can build a group to counter uh, the uh, um, uh, Ultraman and Superwoman and Owl and all of them when they finally make their way to Earth. He's trying to build up something against them because they he probably ran you know, his own criminal organization on Earth 3 and it got destroyed, got killed by those dudes. And so um, I'm thinking he's going to somehow be a foil you know, not only to what he's doing now with the Justice League and everything, but then once the villains come in, he's going to play a bigger role in turning the tide against them to try to get them off Earth because he wants Earth for himself. So, uh, again, I may be reading way too much into it, but that's kind you, of... I'm looking at that. You heard it here first, people. I think we just... We just, uh, quote-unquote, spoiled part, at least part of Trinity War. Or at least deduced. Yes. Because that's definitely Alfred. Like, everything points to... It. He's got to be Alfred. Yeah, he looks like just a... A gray-skinned version of Alfred. Well, because when I first saw him, I thought he was just supposed to be some knockoff of the Joker, like the old-style Joker, you know, because mm -hmm. he's got that, the pale skin, and, you know, he wears the nice suit and has the cane and everything. Um, but then as time went on, after we got to this episode of Justice League of America, uh, then I kind of went back and started thinking about, you know, especially that break-in at the mansion at, uh, you know, Wayne Manor, Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got the kryptonite here in this one, so it's like you start to put those puzzle pieces together, and he's playing a much bigger role than being just this knockoff villain in the pages of Justice League of America. And actually, I want to say it's this issue of Justice League of America from this week, where it's like on the first or second page, there's a pic there's an image of him in a panel, and in that panel, that picture, he, he definitely looks like Alfred to me. Yeah, he's like sitting at the table looking yeah. at his little coin, and yeah, he definitely looks like it. The other thing I thought was interesting in this book is we hear a little bit more about the question. Um, one thing I was actually having a conversation uh, with somebody about the other day was when you look at the trinity of sin, you've got Pandora, you've got Judas, who's the Phantom Stranger, and then there's a third guy. And I kept asking people, you know, who's this third guy? And no one, no one can figure it out. No one can figure out who this, this third guy is. Well, in this issue of Justice League of America, uh, whatever the question did, his crime was so bad that they wiped his memory and wiped away his identity. And so him not having an identity is why he has no face. 
So before, you know, question was this guy who was a reporter who'd pull out the putty and put it on his face and he'd release the gas and it made it look like he has no face. Well, you know, now he's actually this supernatural en entity who has no identity. He's um, just this wandering spirit who's got no place to call his own. And um, now, and of course, now that I'm in the middle of this conversation, I've completely lost it, but there was some mythological character um, who was forced to wander the earth? Uh, not Kane from Kung Fu. Uh, it was somebody else who was from, forced the, from to... another former media. Yeah, well, from uh, I, like I, I don't remember if it was like a Native American uh, story or if it was like a oh man of of all times. Now is the time I can't think. Of like it. the Forgotten One, the like Gilgamesh. Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah. Um, just a guy whose entire identity has been wiped out and it's hidden from himself. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we see Phantom Stranger kind of struggling, like what's his place in the world and whatever. But whoever the question is, he's a guy who actually, and so it's it's one of those things where they may never answer it. Yeah, you know? he may be that character that's forever, you know, has no identity, and that may just be who he is, and they may never, you know specify a person but you know it, it's funny because I was having this conversation with people and I go well you know because the Phantom Stranger is Judas and people are going what? like yeah he's he's the guy who betrayed Jesus if you go back and read it they're, they keep talking about how he betrayed the guy who was so nice and pure and you know whatever and he had the, the coins that he sold the guy out for and those coins became his necklace and I couldn't believe how many people didn't make that connection to Judas yeah, uh, from the Bible, that kind of surprised me. But yeah, uh, everything about Trinity War, I'm loving. Everything about Justice League right now, um, for the first time in my life, I'm looking forward to an issue of Justice League Dark. And yeah, that's take I'll, be I'll be reading my first Justice League Dark next week. Same here. Oh, and I got to give uh, Tim Dog a lot of credit. I just flipped to that page that he was referencing, where uh, the Outsider slash Alfred. You know where the resemblance in this particular uh, uh, side shot uh, really does look a lot like Alfred, and I totally didn't pick it up the first time through. So good pickup on Tim's part. And I actually wouldn't have noticed it until because I have just I had read that Bleeding Cool article where they speculated on out, the outsider being Alfred from the mm. Earth three, and then what? Well, like I said, when I flipped to that second whatever page it was, I was like, oh. Yeah, you look like Alfred. <laughs> thank, thank you, Doug Mackey. The other uh, thing was, if you read all of the Flashpoint tie-ins, there was an Outsider series, um, and in that one, he was a guy from India, so it was you know not Alfred in Flashpoint. But okay. that guy um, was a criminal mastermind. Uh, whatever his superpowers were, gave him uh, pale skin. He was bald. He was thin. He was lanky. Uh, he wore a white suit. Um, always had a suit and tie, you know, looked impeccable. Um, so he had that, that kind of clean look like Alfred always has. Um, but he uh, he was a criminal mastermind of that world, and he basically, like, unified all of Asia, more or less, into his criminal empire. Um, so, you know, him, the, the idea that a character, um, you know, whoever this outsider is, coming from another Earth where he's... Um, you know, he's this criminal mastermind who controlled, you know, a large portion of the Earth. Uh, I think that, that makes sense that that's why that story was in Flashpoint. Like, that's why the character was there, because they probably were foreshadowing to this, uh, playing around with the character. And that's why I think there's going to be some tie-in with the, uh, the crime syndicate, because I could totally see if this guy, you know, controls all of Asia, and then suddenly, you know, the criminal Justice League shows up and says they're going to take over the whole world, and there goes his criminal empire, he's definitely going to have a grudge. So, uh, I think there's going to be some sort of tie-in there. Okay. Uh, anything I else? Read, from... I read way too many comics. That's impossible. <laughs> uh, anything else from Justice League of America number six? Did you read it, Agent Seventy? I did, did although not as it? exactly not as carefully as you folks. <laughs> I wasn't crazy about Doug Mankey's art in this. 
I don't know why. I mean, I, I guess what it is, well, I guess my biggest problem is that I'm just not nearly as invested in the New 52 stuff, and there were a lot of elements in this book taken from beyond the, you know, what, what I'm familiar with in terms of the Justice League stuff. Yeah. So, you know, all that, you know, all that was basically uh, thrown into the pot and stirred, and maybe some of it just didn't quite make sense. Yeah, like um, if you hadn't been reading Justice League of America, all the stuff with Steve Trevor and Amanda Waller would kind of leave you like having no idea what they're even talking about. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Wonder Woman, of course, uh, she runs off to talk to uh, what's his face who makes all the weapons, Hepa Hephaestus. Yeah, whatever his name is. Um, Thinking he made Pandora's box. But he didn't make Pandora's box. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. There are other gods in play. There we go. So while we're on DC, we'll let's see. Go. Uh, it was actually a, kind of a light week for DC this week. Yeah, it wasn't so bad. I still haven't read everything that I planned on reading. Put it that way. Uh, Animal Man 22. Uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> Did you read it? No, I'm just sort of, I'm just sort of naming some of the. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> yeah, bigger name books that came out. So if I don't hear anything, I'll just move on to the next one. That's how I've kind of been doing it last couple of weeks. Uh, I guess in I'm assuming print format, Batman 66 number one, because that been coming out digital, hasn't it? Yeah. Which I'm gonna check out eventually. Have you? Have you? So you haven't checked out the digital version at all? No, they're ninety nine cents I hear, so I'm like, hey, my yeah. well. Yeah, well the the this uh particular one in digital is being done the same way Marvel Infinity is. So you'll have a panel and you you tap the button and one of the characters in the panel may move and you tap the button and someone may come into focus and something else goes out of focus, you know, as opposed to the regular comic. So it was kind of interesting to see how they translated that into a print comic. Because one panel of the print comic may actually be three or four panels digitally. To reflect the movie. Mm. Yeah, so it is kind of interesting because I've got the digital one, so I just kind of sat there, you know, for 20 minutes and did a comparison, kind of flipping between them. And, uh, you know, it, it was interesting to see. Obviously, it's going to take a lot of work to plan out a book like this when you got to plan, you know, it's digital versus print. Usually they just cut the page in half and you don't have to worry about it, but then they have this extra step now where it's. It's not only transitions, kind of half, but yeah, they got to figure out how to make the panel work, you know, so which, as a static image as well as being fluid. Which way do you prefer for this um, one, just for this comic, since you well, read both versions? In general, I don't really care for the the way Marvel does Infinity, and I don't really care for the way they do that, where you tap on the panel and one thing moves in the panel and everything else stays the same. Because to me, that just seems too much like really crappy animation. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm tapping it and something moves. and I, I'm not a big fan of that, so I I prefer... Um, the, Straightforward the, comic. Well, the other thing that, that DC's doing as part of their digital initiative is they're going to do those choose-your-own-adventure type stories where the, the storyline is going to branch and you choose which branch of the story you're going to follow. So I'm looking a little more forward to that than this. Um... I don't mind reading a digital comic, and I don't mind reading a print comic, but I really enjoy, if I'm going to do that, reading the printed page on my computer screen or on my tablet screen as opposed to going panel by panel or having these crappy little transitions and animations in between them. Okay. All right. Uh, Batman and Catwoman number 22. No chance to read it. I think I'm going to stop reading these Batman and books. Because he's still grieving over... It's, the whole still grieving over yeah. Damien. And it seems, it's been months now. And are even the other Batman books here and acknowledging it anymore? Well, yeah, Incorporated is still like on the day it happened. So yeah, in, I, stopped, I stopped reading that too after <laughs> I read his death issue. So... Um, what did you, oh, you need to go back and read the uh, Incorporated from last week or the week before, okay. uh, the one that just came out. You definitely, because there's, uh, 
In fact, I think Bleeding Cool tried to spoil it uh, even, so you may have actually seen what it is. But go back and read that issue because uh, uh, there's some stuff in there that's actually... Uh, I don't even know how to explain it. Uh, it's pretty okay. wicked. Pretty wicked. So That's a nice that. teaser. <laughs> okay. And I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Like I don't want to say too much, you know. But we may have talked about it on the show, but I obviously don't remember. <laughs> but go back and read it. We'll talk about it next week. Go back and read uh, the Batman Incorporated that just came out last week or the week before, and uh, we'll talk about it next week. Okay. Um, anyone read Batman and Catwoman twenty two? No, I'm not a Catwoman fan. Okay. There was a Batman Beyond Unlimited number 18. That's digital, I'm assuming. Or is that... Yeah, that's digital. Yeah, that's the print of the digital. No, oh, the print of the digital, okay. Yeah, because the Unlimited gets all the stories together. Yeah. Uh, Batwoman 22, Birds of Prey, Prey 22, uh, blah, blah, blah. Green Lantern, New Guardians 22. I have net... I have not read this one, but I plan on it. Cause... I read it. Oh. I've read it. Anything, anything yeah, I know, right? I'm it? chirping up. I'm like, hey, I actually read a DC <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's It's definitely moving the Green Lantern portion of the DC universe towards, uh, what is that, Lights Out, that they're, they're going to call this event or something like yeah, that? Yeah, just a, a month-long event. Right. They're, 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 they're moving the line towards that particular event by uh, establishing the new big bad in the Green Lantern portion of the universe named Relic. And basically in this issue, uh, Relic uh, basically does his due diligence on the current status of the, of the Lantern Corps, the various Lantern Corps uh, in the DCU and uh, kind of establishes that he's a really, really tough guy and he's going to be a, a, a big bad and be very hard for the, uh, the combined might of the, the various cores to take down. So it's definitely uh, a building block for that storyline. Okay. Um, I skipped Fables 131, but did anyone read it? Take that as a no. <laughs> uh, we talked about Justice League of America already. I haven't read Justice League of America's Vibe number 6 yet, but I will. More chirps. Yeah. Uh, there was Supergirl 22 and Legion of Superheroes 22. Anybody? Uh, you know, I I own Supergirl. I've got a copy sitting right here. I just haven't had time to get to it yet. Um, I like, in general, where the storyline's been going the last couple months. Uh, Michael Allen Nelson took over, and basically Supergirl's dying from the kryptonite poisoning. She was not 100% cured, and she's going off into space to try to see if she can track down some sort of cure or something. She's She's got to get away from Earth. Just too much stuff has happened, um, so she's kind of doing her own exile thing, uh, kind of like what happened with Superman several years ago. Uh, well, I say several years ago, uh, twenty years ago, whatever. Um, right. But I mean, I, this particular issue, I just haven't had time to get to yet. But overall, I've, I have been enjoying where Supergirl has been going the last couple months. And last from DC is Wonder Woman twenty two, which I haven't read yet, but I will. I actually started reading Wonder Woman last. I guess last month's issue with 21. Didn't really know what was going on, but hey, no time like the present to jump into a book. Well, <laughs> it had it had the new gods in it, so I was you know curious about it, and uh, I flipped through this particular one. Um, but I, I don't know. There's just something about Wonder Woman in the the New 52 that I just I don't care about as much. I, I don't know if it's because they've done so much to rely on her. Uh, her B characters, you know, it's not so much about her, but it's about her relationships with her friends and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, like, eh, I don't know. I'm just not. And I hear so much good stuff about it, so I'm like, hey, let me, let me go um, for it. But you did skip uh, one DC book that I read this week that I enjoyed quite a bit. Oh, let me see. Can I guess He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Oh. Tell us about it. <laughs> um, one of the things that this book is doing is, is giving like a new mythology to the characters. You know, they had their own storyline in the mini comics when the toys came out, and then the cartoon came out and kind of redid the entire storyline, and then uh, it all kind of died away for a while. And then 
they brought back the toys and with the toys they've been doing a new mythology and so they just decided there's all these different versions of He-Man out there we'll just go ahead and do our own so they've done their own storyline here in uh, DC Comics and the main the main story that they put together here really feels like Jack Kirby's Fourth World and a lot of people have made the comment that uh, you know the Masters of the Universe movie that came out in the uh, 80s felt like a fourth world story. It just happened to be, you know, He-Man and Skeletor, but it really felt like it was uh, Orion and uh, and Darkseid. And that's kind of what they're doing here. They've made Hordak into the Darkseid character. Uh, Hordak kidnapped uh, She-Ra, basically, Princess Adora, when she was a little girl, and raised her as his own daughter. And he's made her uh, the head of his army. And he sent his army to Eternia uh, to basically destroy King Randor and his empire and to take over Castle Grayskull uh, because that's where all the magic is. You know, all the magic has been fortified within Castle Grayskull. So there's this ongoing siege uh, that's being led by Hordak's armies against Castle Grayskull, and it's being led by uh, Princess Adora. And the thing is, it's like King Randor recognizes, uh, Man-at-Arms recognizes that that's um, He-Man's long-lost sister, that's Prince Adam's long-lost sister, but Prince Adam hasn't figured it out yet. And it's like they're keeping the secret from him. Uh, Tila gets kidnapped uh, and taken by Princess Adora, and, uh, and so she's beginning to figure out that the two of them are related, that they're twin brother and sister, um, but they haven't figured, but, you know, Princess Adora hasn't figured it out either. Um, being raised by Hordak. She thinks that she is the legitimate spawn of Hordak. Uh, all these other people realize that she is the long-lost princess and missing twin sibling of Prince Adam. Uh, so there's that whole kind of, uh, like, kingdom versus kingdom, you know, the, the new world, uh, new genesis versus apocalypse, the way that they traded their kids, uh, you know, to raise them differently. They're kind of playing on that motif a little bit on here. And they're really playing this up as uh, kings and kingdoms and armies. You know, it's whenever you think He-Man, you always think of, you know, brutes with swords and the big fights with Skeletor, and you've got Cringer hiding in the corner, and Beast Man always, you know, he drops the magical device, and, you know, everybody gets away. Um, but they've really played this up, kind of really playing on that, that um, medieval feel to it. Even though there's magic and sorcery and, you know, flying cars and whatever, it really does feel like th like they, they took Conan uh, and added the sci-fi element to it, you know. Uh, so I've really been enjoying the stuff that they've been doing here. And uh, even if you've never read, you know, Masters of the Universe or He-Man comic before, if you kind of play with the toys as a kid, but, you, you know, you're not really into the storyline, you could pick this up with issue one and it's really made, it's a new storyline, a new mythology. It works for new readers, which is why a lot of the, the toy fans are, like, pissed off and freaking out because it's like, <laughs> that doesn't follow the cartoon! It's like, no, it's it's actually good. Uh, and so That's uh, funny. I've, I've really I been enjoying it. We reviewed issue number one. Well, I just don't recall. I don't know if we ever got around to doing two and three. So I'm glad that it's up to four, and I don't know if it's gaining steam or not, but... Uh, with any luck, it'll keep going. Well, I'm hoping it's one of those things that when it hits issue six and they put out the trade paperback, that a bunch more people are going to give it a shot because this does, as a property, as a licensed property, a lot of the people will not go out and buy the monthly comic. They'll wait until the trade shows up at Barnes & Noble, you know? Right. Um, so I'm hoping that once they get the six issues out and they bundle it together that that you know, really kind of brings up the bottom line on it and uh, brings a whole bunch of new readers to it because it is really well done. And it's written by Keith Giffen. Um, you know, and he's, a, he's a stalwart in the industry. You know, he's been working for, what, 40 years now in comics? So um, he definitely has the chops to do it, and he's been doing a pretty good job. Okay. A long time I... Uh... I didn't even know there was a He-Man comic until they announced that He-Man versus DC or He-Man DC team up book. Yeah, yeah, and that starts next month, does it? That's what I thought this was. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, let me skip that. Although I'm kind of curious now that there's the whole like Villains Month reveal that the 
Justice League is supposed to be dead. I'm wondering if the Justice League is somehow being shifted over to the Masters of the Universe universe for a month. And mm-hmm. so it's like the like they're gone and they're fighting against uh, the Masters of the Universe and then they pop back into the regular New 52 universe. I'm wondering if it's something along those lines where it's going to tie into the New 52 that way. Okay. So Not that's a bad DC. idea. I mean, it's a good way to make it work. Like, if you, they want to get the heroes gone for a month so they can have the villains do the takeover, the best way to do it is to, you know, shuffle them off to a parallel universe, you know, and uh, what better universe to throw them off to but the other DC property of Masters of the Universe because everybody wants to see He-Man and, you know, Superman going at it, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I see you. Kind of skimming through some of the independent books or companies. Did anyone here. read? Uh, we just we're about to pass Dynamite. I'm presuming. Did anyone read Red Sonia number one? No. No. I didn't get to it either. Ah. Uh. Honestly, I saw that Gail Simone was writing it, and I was just like, "Man, eh. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be so edgy." Oh my god. I read none of her books, by the way. Not because I don't like her. Half of it is because I mostly grew up reading Marvel stuff, so I never read any of her. I don't even know what she did before she was in DC. But, like, Fat Girl, I don't read now. And yeah. I, I tried the movement when it came out, and I read the first issue, and I was like, nah. So, I don't know her. I don't see the appeal of her, necessarily. Mm-hmm. Hey, Dirt. That's just me. Hey, what? Uh, I, w- I was going through the list of things that came out this week, and I noticed that the latest Overstreet comic book price guide came out this week. Is that a big seller in your store? Nope. Not at all? No, the internet exists. Why do you need a book? No, I understand. I was, I was kind of <laughs> curious to see what people do for pricing uh, nowadays and how they treat the hard cover or I just like uh, the hard you know, copy of uh, price guides. Yeah, when we when when our store decided to pick up comics and we first kind of shifted over because we started out as a video game and toy store and we added on comics, you know, a couple years ago. Um, we bought in Overstreet the first year and we quickly found out that. Prices in a price guide are great, but that doesn't mean people are paying that. Right. Um, we found that the number one thing you do is you go to eBay, and you type in the book you're looking for, and there's a little button on the side down at the bottom that says completed listings, and you click that completed listings, and it shows you what the books have actually sold for in the last 30 days. Um, and it'll be if it's listed in red, it means it didn't sell. If it's listed in green, it means it did sell. And that's the number one thing that we price off of. No kidding. Okay. You, yeah, you just go and you look at the listings. And, of course, yeah, You're you not know, the only store that, that's told me the same, you know, uh, yeah. similar story. So uh, I'm just, I was just curious. That's why I asked. It's, it's not that there isn't, you know, a little bit of fudging, of course, because, you know, things are graded, uh, whether it's not something's mint or near mint or, you know, good or fine or, you know, whatever. Uh, that's going to, you know, fluctuate prices, you know, here and there. Uh, and you always try to take that into account, but... The majority of books that, that you get nowadays, um, most everything is considered near mint because most people pick it up, they flip through it, read it once, and put it in bag and board, and you know they don't touch it for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so everything just kind of hits that same kind of price level anymore. And for the most part, you just you go to eBay because if it's sold, then you know what the price is people are willing to pay for it. And stuff like um, Batman Incorporated 8, uh, where you know Damien gets killed, you think that that's a big issue. You know, there's going to be big money in that. But you go and you look, and when it actually sells, it sells for maybe twelve dollars. You know, there are people that put, you know, Death of Damien, hard to find issue, sold out, first print, fifty bucks. But nobody's buying them for fifty bucks. You know, so that's one of the things. Like with the price guide, the price guide may say, well, this is a highly collectible issue. It's worth thirty dollars. Well, just because it's worth thirty dollars in a guide doesn't mean people are paying it. Right. And, well, and, I was just and, going to say that uh, it's probably it's probably more useful for older books as opposed to things that may be hot, you know, relatively hot off the press. So yeah, well, and over the last two or three years, a lot more comics have been listed on eBay and selling. So a couple of years ago, if you would get something like um, 
the first appearance of U.S. Agent. You right. know, you might not necessarily find that on eBay, being kind of older and obscure. Um, but nowadays, I mean, it's it's very rare to run across a book that isn't listed or recently sold on eBay. Um, I mean, it, that's just pretty much the entire history of comics is on eBay, uh, you know, for good or for bad. So I guess we'll, I, you know, I guess eventually we're going to see the uh, the demise of the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. Is uh, as sad as that sounds for some of the older felt or the older fans. Well, and the funny thing is that most people that bought Overstreet, like they. Honestly, they weren't buying it for the guide them itself with the prices. They were buying it to look up. Uh, they wanted to find like what was the first appearance of a character. Like they were using it as an index. You know, um, Adventures of Superman. Uh, a lot of people didn't know like it took over from Superman, and then there was a new Superman volume, and then Superman went back to the old numbers. You know, people were trying to figure out how the volumes fit together and stuff like that. But nowadays, you got the internet. Right. You know, you just type into Google whatever you're looking for, and Google finds it for you. You know, so uh, the stuff like that from Overstreet is is going away too. Like, there's really, it's very hard to find a compelling reason for publications like that to exist. Yeah, it's kind of like why Wizard went away, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, and part well, of Wizard was, went away for a couple of different reasons. Yeah, but. there was a lot of fanboyish stuff going on in Wizard and things like that. A lot of speculation stuff. But mm. yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that Wizard was known for for a long time was that it had that price guide of the latest prices. But you know, even now, um, you know, something's going to go to print and it's not going to come out for you know what six weeks, eight weeks, and in the course of six to eight weeks, prices on stuff can dramatically change. Because of what gets published and you know leaked out. There's printings too, so. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, and especially when things go back to second, third, fourth print, a lot of times it makes those first print prices come down, because the collector's market isn't the same as it was, and people go, well, I just want to read it, I don't care if it's a first print, you know, um, and so that's another reason why digital has taken off uh, so much. Um, ICV2 just had a report over the last you know week or so, where they said that. Uh, you know, print sales are up, um, you know, so it's definitely helping the industry, but digital sales are up like 700% over two years ago. Um, you know, so there's this ginormous growth in digital sales, even though there is still growth in paper sales. You know, so it's this growth of digital is coming from a whole different market of people um, who normally weren't buying print that didn't care about print. And we see that quite a lot where people come in and they're like, you know, uh, do you have... Uh, you know, such and such issue of Walking Dead. And we're like, well, yeah, we've got like a third print over there of, uh, you know, 105 or something. There's a second print or third print. And they're like, oh, yeah, cool, whatever. And they buy it because they don't care if it's a second or third print. They just want to read that issue. That's an issue that they missed, you know, so. Yeah, people aren't really buying comics, to, you know, for collector's items anymore. Yeah, it, nowadays we don't even treat something as being that particularly special unless it's autographed. Uh, if someone walks in with a bunch of books that are autographed, then we'll we'll pay them, uh, you know, a nice amount for it because that is something that people will buy to collect because they like the writer or artist and the fact that they signed it means something to them. Uh, mm -hmm. But just having a, a first print of something, uh, you know, special anniversary issue or you know stuff like that, just none of that means anything anymore. Right. I don't know what that has to do with Red Sonia, but there you go. <laughs> no, I was moving on to uh, Gemstone Publishing. We had just passed yeah. Dynamite and some of the other uh, independents, so I was moving down the list of independent uh, publishers. Um, we move on to IDW, anybody? Wait, wait, did you skip Dark Horse? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he jumped to dynamite, so right because I was going well, I can go back to dark horse. I was going alphabetically because we were we jumped straight to DC, so we skipped dark horse. Oh uh, yeah, we should have dark horse at the beginning. But I haven't read anything from dark horse. But if someone has, what do you well, got? Oh, you got something from dark horse? Nope, I don't. No, nope. I'm the only person that read dark horse this week. Oh man, dark horse hates us. <laughs> um, no, because I like Star Wars, <laughs> and I'm gonna read that Captain Midnight series when it starts. Yeah, um, well, Dream Thief uh, that I'm showing here, Dream Thief issue three. Um, I continue to love this series. Uh, this is the guy who falls asleep, and when he wakes up, uh, for some reason, he's murdered somebody, and he's got to figure out why. And it turns out that what's happening is 
people who have been wrongfully murdered are coming into his body and taking over his body when he falls asleep and getting revenge. And one of the things that will happen is after he wakes up, uh, he'll wake up for a while and he'll start trying to put the pieces together. And while he's thinking about it, the memories of the person who took over his body will start to flood in. So he'll get to see their life and the things that led up to their demise. And then he'll see what they did in his body in order to get their revenge. And so he's starting to find out that these murders that he's been committing while he's asleep are all somehow connected. So we're not quite sure, you know, like why he's in this string, like why this string is together, but every murder that happens is somehow connected to some other murder, uh, you know, that's happened that, that's happened previously in the story. Um, so like, for instance, um, he, he murders his girlfriend. He doesn't understand why. Well, his, his girlfriend had murdered some other guy who she thought was this creep who was... Uh, um, you know, going to abduct her and rape her, but it turns out he was just a, a regular dude who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and she read it the wrong way. Um, and then she, uh, his girlfriend, had been connected with like some other guy who was dealing drugs on the side, and so that guy ended up getting murdered. So he took over his body uh, in order to murder the guys who had murdered him. And um, the guys who had murdered him were part of this like gay porn ring, and so he wakes up in a, in a room full of. Uh, De uh, dead gay porn stars. He's got to figure out why he's there. One of the guys who's in there, uh, you know, had been the victim of a hate crime, and you know, uh, victim of the hate crime. Uh, someone else, because of the hate crime, had ended up dead, and so he wakes up the next morning, and he's standing in front of a a KKK um, leader who's hanging from the tree in front of him, and he doesn't understand why he killed this KKK guy. But then the pieces start to come together, and you know, it's like all these. All these things are interconnected, and you don't really you don't know the big picture yet, but it's starting to come together, and I really like that in the storytelling. You almost soaked me on it. Yeah, and check it out. It's you gotta good. check it out. It's really fun. Um, the other it's book, a limited series, right? Yeah, it's only yeah, five. three or five. Okay. The, the other yeah. one here is uh, "To Hell You Ride," which is the uh, horror story co-written by Lance Henriksen. Uh, the actor who's been in like 900,000 movies. Um, and this is the uh, the final part of his horror story of this small town that's been taken over. Um, this Native American who never cared about his history and his past gets stuck in like this legend. Um, he's starting to get overtaken by ghosts of uh, the uh, Native Americans who want to have revenge on the white man. And, you know, he kind of starts to... He gets kind of conflicted in the middle of the story because it's like on the one hand it's like, okay, yeah, you know these, the white man came in and stole our land and whatever. But he's like, we weren't exactly the nicest people either, you know. Yeah. He starts looking at the tribe wars in between each other and how they would, you know, scalp each other and kill each other and whatever. So, uh, it's kind of been a fun, well, I don't want to say fun, uh, but it's been kind of an interesting look at the way that you know different people look at their heritage and history and. Um, you know things like that, and then plus it's it's just good and gory and bloody, and people explode and people catch on fire and you know uh, immolate in the middle of a hotel lobby and you know stuff like that. So it's just got some neat stuff all the way around, and it's it's been a, a really fun story. Did it wrap up well? Because it looks like this was the last issue in this limited series. Yeah, yeah, this was number five of five. Um, I'm trying to think here. It leaves it. I'm presuming it's got to leave it with some sort of, you know, open end, open ended uh, bit, so that there's a possibility of a sequel, right? Um, not, I mean, not so much. Uh, I mean, I guess I'll just go ahead and spoil it since the book's out. The guy dies at the end. Uh, he 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 dies, and the people of this town that have been stuck in the middle of this battle kind of, like he he sacrifices himself against these. Um, vindictive demons, these vindictive ghosts that have come to haunt this town, and he, he sacrifices himself to stop it, and so all the people kind of come, and they, you, you've got the, the, you know, the white man and the red man coming together, and they, they wrap up his body, and they carry him off in the mountains to give him a proper burial, and they, they, you get this feeling that, that you're not, the story that you've just read 
you know, when you read comics, they're they're written from the standpoint of this is what's happening, but you get to the end and you get the feeling of it's several years in the future and you've just heard the legend of this character. So it kind of leaves with that feeling that that story that you've just finished is now, you know, something that uh, someone has told someone else and it's been handed down, you mm-hmm. know, a generation to generation. Um, so it, it does kind of have more of a, of like this epic legendary feel when it wraps up to it. So um, it, it was a good ending, yeah. Call it Beowulf. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, we actually skipped past Boom Studios too. So did you have anything? Uh, yeah, I didn't Aspen, have... Avatar, Boom. I didn't have anything uh, from them. Dark Horse. Anything else? I do want to mention when we get to IDW. I see there was a Dark Horse number one, a Blood Brothers number one. I, I, I kind of skipped. I I saw the cover for that. Uh, I was kind of curious about it, but. If no one's read it, maybe I'll take a look at it for next week or the week after. Um, I, I just kind of skimmed it briefly because when I was going through the comics, I was like, oh, what the heck is this thing? And it's oh. um, vampires in modern day. Um, I'm sure that person that drew the cover probably didn't draw the inside, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, okay, I might check was, that out then. From what, I, from what I gathered, it's like the two guys... Uh, there's like a black guy and a white guy, but they're both vampires, so they, they're considered the Blood Brothers. Right. Um, and there's like this gang of vampires that are like your your motorcycle gang, you know. Uh, they're like the mean guys who are coming in town and, you know, killing people. And these other two guys are vampires, but like they don't want to be. So it's like they're the good guys fighting against the bad guys, even though they're all vampires. Um, but I, I didn't get into it really in depth. I just kind of, you know, it's like this is brand new, so I just kind of skimmed through it. But it is something that I plan to get back. I'm gonna go on Dark Horse's website and see if I can find the preview pages for that. Cool. But um, let's see. I haven't read anything from IDW for this week, but I did want to mention the Teenage Mutant, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles villain micro series number four for a uh, four of Allopets. I will be reading that this weekend. I've kind of given up on the G.I. Joe comics for now. And Half Past Danger, number three, I might skim through. I'm trying to find... Uh, Anyone else say anything from uh, IDW they want to mention? Not this week. Uh, you know what? Uh, I, I hate doing it, but uh, I read X-Files number two... And it's not good. Um, I'm really. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it like I don't know. I don't know if you guys were big X Files fans when the TV show came out, but like for me, the original TV show it it ended in a place that was different from where it started. And on the one hand, it's good to have growth, but on the other hand, like when the show first started, you would see someone talking about ghosts. You know, but you didn't actually see ghosts. And someone would talk about aliens, but you didn't actually see aliens. Like someone would go out in the woods and there'd be a bright light and then they'd come back and they'd say, whoa, it was a UFO. But you didn't really know if it was a UFO. You didn't know if it was a government, you know, plot. You didn't know if it was, uh, you know, the Soviets with some new technology. You know, you really didn't know what was going on. And that was the whole point of, like, I want to believe. There were things you had to take on faith and things that, you know, weren't explained. And when the show ended, they explained everything. Like, they just flat out laid out, oh, these aliens came to Earth, and they were going to colonize by interbreeding, and the secret government was set up to deal with them, but then they brought in their own shape-shifting bounty hunters to try to kill them so they could get out of the deal, and it was like, it was really stupid once you heard it. Right. Um, <laughs> and this, like, it can, it's continuing on that whole storyline of there are these shape-shifting super soldiers who are alien-human hybrids. Oh, God, they're scrolls! And it's... Like, the the lone gunmen are alive, but they're in a secret bunker hidden under their graves in uh, this... in Arlington National Cemetery. And so Mulder, in order to find him, has to dig up the grave, and it looks like it's a coffin lid, but he opens the coffin lid, and it's a stairway down to their secret bunker... And it's like, this is just stupid. Like, you know, it's... 
I, I so wanted this to be good and to have that kind of old school feel, but it just feels like the the, the worst B movie conspiracy. You know, it's like there's a group called the Asylum. Like when there's a new Transformers movie, they make a movie called Transmorphers. You know, <laughs> That's when, right. That's right. You know, they, they do, and this feels like a knockoff of something. Like it doesn't mm. feel. Doesn't it, feel original. No, it, it's right. it's there's so much about it that's just so bad, and and the characters like they they meet up with the lone gunman and of course everybody looks the same. You know, apparently no one's fashions or hairstyles or facial hair have changed in, you know, the 15 years since the show's been on. And, you know, it's just like, uh, I, I just, I wanted it to be so much more than what it is. And what it is is not anything special. And I'm just so disappointed by it. <laughs> so I, thumbs I, down, thumbs down. I, I just looked at the preview pages for the Blood Brothers and, the, yes, the art is different on the inside. Uh -huh. It's not horrible. It kind of gave me like a Chris Samney type vibe to it, but oh, I won't be reading it. Oh, I lost blood brothers. Anyway. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, image. See. Image. I just want to mention Invincible number four, even though I'm not reading it. I should just start with issue 100 and keep reading forward, because I'll never get caught up. <laughs> Actually. 70 plus issues to get caught up. You know, I thought the same thing, and I read the majority of Invincible in one afternoon. I probably read from issue 12 through issue 90 in the course yeah, of Yeah, that's day. like, actually, let me tell you right now what issue I'm on. Open the iPad. It, it is a very easy read, and it all flows together very well. And, um, and, and I have to say that the book... In Invincible, like you know, in Invincible, that Invincible himself is never going to die, um, but there's everyone else around him is kind of fair game, right? And there have been characters along the way that have that have died, and so when a villain comes in, like you see this cover, that's his uh, his fiance um, who's pregnant with his child. She gets attacked. And while you're reading the book, there's a very real sense that she could die or the baby could not make it. Right. And, and that's the type of thing that Kirkman is not afraid to do in his book. You know, so at least he's put a book together where you actually kind of care about the characters and there is a real sense of danger. You know, th there's never a sense of danger for Invincible, but it's he's trying to always save all the people around him because of his actions. And his involvement, and so uh, it, it it was like this issue 104 was a very good issue. Well, I see that I'm on issue 16. Okay, well you can get up to 90 in one afternoon. If I yeah, if I didn't have any you know other things to do, I'm I'm gonna see if I can get to 30 in two weeks. Baby steps, man. Baby steps. Yeah. Progress. Come on, what else are you doing all day? I mean, seriously. Are you saving the world? Are you building a nuclear reactor? No, come on, sit down and, and read some Invincible. Not some Invincible out. That's the goal. Okay, so nothing else from Image. Let's get into Marvel. Um, I'm not going to go through every Marvel book, so I'm going to start alphabetical order and just name stuff. So if I skip, you see me skip something, let me know. All New X-Men number 14, which I wrote a review, which you can read on theclicknation.com. And popculturenetwork.com. No kidding. Another fine issue by Bendis and Imam Nin. Imanin, right. Imanin, nin, nin. I like Imanin toast. Me too. I like his colors. Well, actually, I guess he doesn't do the colors, but I like the colors in his book. So the all new X Men, well, the original X-Men take on Mystique and Sabretooth and Silver Samurai and some Hydra agents. Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra. And there's a lot of deception with Lady... Oh, yeah, and Lady Mastermind's there. Yeah, so there's I, a lot of deception. Yeah, I give Bendis some credit, you, you know, and, and, and Eminem some credit for pulling off a lot of those uh, Lady Mastermind illusions. Illusions always been like a blah power to me. Right, but I, you know, they, they, they actually, you know, they, the way they depict, depicted it in this issue were pretty, was pretty good. 
except when Phantom Menace does his misdirection. That's, kind that's of another cool. story. I, yeah, that that uh, that's actually yeah, we'll get... part of uh, A plus X actually this week. Oh, I, yeah, didn't get, and, um, I didn't get to read Uncanny X Force. I'm assuming. Yeah, I guess and Uncanny X Force. I didn't read A plus X, but I guess since they're trying to do like consecutive issues, I need to read it. But well, uh, not yet. <laughs> as I'm saying, whenever they start, they get to that part. Gotcha. I need to, to do it. But uh, so yeah, there's some funny bits in here with Iceman and Thor, and I, I thought the ending was kind of abrupt with that like one or two page panel with Jean Grey, but. Besides that, fine issue. It was good. Uh, Avengers number 16, more Hickman mumbo jumbo, but at least it's drawn by Stefano Caselli. <laughs> it wasn't that much mumbo jumbo this month. Or this week, because I think nah, this is coming really. up by week. Yeah, because it was co written or co plotted or whatever by Nick Spencer. By Spencer, right. <laughs> I got one thing to say about this, and Doug may get this. But but we had a, a sighting of Space Knights of Galador. <laughs> Freaking that that, awesome! Is that who that, is that, who that uh, the, the four super. Space Knights who were yeah who were the, there's four Space Knights who are who are flying up towards the reader on, in one panel. It's pretty cool. Didn't uh, they just reprint that? They did. They did the uh, the Chris Batista drawn, I believe, and I think it was Jim Starlin wrote that. Uh, that that Space Knights limited series that tried to reboot the Space Knight uh, mythology, but uh, it was just nice to see that uh, Galador made an appearance in uh, in this. And obviously, you know they're 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 laying some groundwork for uh, more spacefaring adventures. You know, within Avengers and Marvel Comics in general. So it was it was nice to see. Um, you know, there's a there's a little bit more development of uh, Night Mask and Star Brand in this. So, uh, you know, and, and there's some fighting as well. It, there's not nearly as much mumbo-jumbo as Tim Dog makes it out to be. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's definitely uh, another building block uh, in the storyline. I enjoyed the stuff with Night Mask and Starbrand. Starbrand. I was checking in back with them because I forgot they existed. <laughs> well, you know, it's if if there's, if there's one weakness to Hickman is that he's got a lot of parallel and intersecting plot lines, and right. he has to service them, basically pretty much each issue, so that you don't forget that they exist. And if you you know, and if he kind of leaves one or two aside, he, he circles back around to get them. You're sort of left, you know, kind of backtracking, like what happened? I don't remember this. So, part of my problem though right now is after Age of Ultron. Like, I don't care about Infinity. Like, I'm so kind of burned out by Marvel and the whole crossover thing and the big event thing that I'm looking at this Infinity and everything that's building up, and I'm just like, I, 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 don't, I don't want to read it. Like, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not feeling any sort of love for it. I'm not excited for it. It's just, it's one of those things that's going to be there, and I'll probably flip through it when it comes in, and I don't feel the need to buy it. I don't feel the need to collect it, you know, it's just it's one of those things that's going to be there and I just, I really don't care right now I don't blame you I don't blame you, especially, you know this, if there's if there was ever a time to really stress event fatigue and, and this was a, a term that was being bandied about, like what, two, two years ago, three years ago I think it's real, now yeah, before even Flashpoint New 52 and all of that, back when right. it was still, uh Secret Avengers or uh, Secret Invasion or Age of M. And uh, yeah, well, yeah, I guess you can go back to even yeah. that stuff. Yeah, you know, Civil War. There was definitely what's Age of M. <laughs> that was uh, what Age of M was. That's not House of M, right? Oh, House, House of M. M. Yes, House, I'm yes. sorry. I, I think I think there was some Age of M. But no, there was a, no, there was an Age of X. What the hell was that? Oh, I'm gonna Google it after the show. <laughs> I don't know, but the, but the point is, but but we've just illustrated the point, which is, you know, all these events seem to blend together, and we are all fatigued by them, so that we don't, we're we're just unable to piece apart, you know, to pick apart what happened in what event. So, you know, well, and also, I'm, de I'm definitely feeling it, so I definitely don't blame you for uh, not so many up of them. Infinity. Yeah, so many of them. When you get to the end, they're so unimportant. Um. I mean, Civil War had some things that at least lasted. Right. Yeah, it, you know, it took about two years before it finally all faded away. But you know, Secret Invasion. What the hell did Secret Invasion prove? Like what? It got Norman uh, in the spotlight. 
yeah, yeah. but so? And it brought back some characters that were right. not to be dead. Exactly. But I mean, you know, it's just it's one of those things where it didn't it didn't really even matter. Like that could have been uh, that could have been a six issue story within Avengers that didn't need to be a massive crossover. You know what I mean? Here's my gripe. Well, that's, that's according to the stock. That's not according to the stockholders. But go on. <laughs> my gripe you know is. Go ahead. I'm, I'm I'm settled on the fact that yes, there's going to be an event every year. No, there's multiple events every year. Well, if if there were only one event a year, I, I should say if there was one event a year, I'd be fine. Usually they usually they only have one a year. The mistake was trying to shove Age of Ultron in here the same uh, three months from Infinity starting, or at least having the end of Age of Ultron take place like three months before Infinity started. And I've griped about that enough, so I won't really get into well, it. And also that it was no good. Yeah. That too. Well, yeah. that Yeah, because it was no good. <laughs> but it was I'll, pretty bad. I was going to say the the whole, you know, because they always hype, you know, this event's going to change everything. Or this is the event of the year. I was like, how can you have Age of Ultron as the event of the year? And then three months later, Infinity, the event of the year. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, and, and the, the scary thing is, is like I know that about the time Infinity number three comes out, Marvel's going to announce the, it's the the final event of, of 2013. Well, they've announced the what's going to come out of Infinity, which is Inhumanity. Right. The, well, yeah, but that's just the Inhumans getting a series, which, again... Well, like that's that. also going to be like the, the banner that's going to be on all the Marvel books, like Heroic Age. Right. Is 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 gonna be humanity in huma- in humanity on all that's like the age or the that's gonna be the big thing for 2014 going forward until the next event. Yeah, uh, does, does anybody care about the Inhumans enough that they're excited for? A you Mayborn? missed you missed my uh, rant last week. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, we definitely so all quickly. So my whole thing is I'm an X Men fan, so I'm a fan of the mutants. They first they. De- First they did House of M and took away a, a whole bunch of mutants and had them down to under 200 because you know there's too many mutants in the Marvel universe. They had to be special, you know, make them more unique and get rid of everyone. That lasted what three years, two, whatever many years it was. They do Age of uh, Avengers for X Men. They bring them all back. Hey, there's more mutants in the world now. So now we're gonna spread Terrigen mist across the globe and create a whole bunch of Inhumans. So now mutants aren't special anymore. Because everyone's in, there'll be a whole bunch of Inhumans instead. Are there going to be so, any Inhuman mutants? So no one knows. There probably will be. <laughs> so now they, like, once again, they're pushing the mutants to the to the back. Got to make room for franchises we have control over in the movies, like Avengers and Inhumans, who we can make movies out of. The only way that they could possibly make it interesting for me is if they bring back Buried Alien. Which oh, is, uh, but I'm bumped. Yeah, if he and Where Quasar make an appearance and they're having a race through the uh, through the galaxy and then they they're brought back to the Marvel Universe, then fine, uh, I'm in at that point. But until that happens, <laughs> man, I'm out until they bring back Rom Space Knight. <laughs> that went totally over Tim's head. Anyway, yeah, um, he's way too young. Yes, I know. So. <sighs> You so know, just just basically the the whole point is we're all very fatigued with events and then, Marvel. But I but that's a bad thing. I'm looking. I I am looking forward to Infinity. I've been looking forward to Infinity. Age of Ultron. I just kind of read to, to read. But no, I am happening. looking. Yeah, because it was there. Like Infinity and Battle of the Atom. Gotta mention that. Right. See, I always considered like the X Men stuff in their own corner of the universe anyway. So I don't really count that as like a big Marvel event. That's just. X-Men yeah, unless they start related. crossing over into everybody. That's the thing. Which I don't yeah. like. I like my X-Men separated. No, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, Avengers Assemble number 17. Haven't read it yet, but I will. Uh, it's more Captain Marvel crossover stuff. And uh, I'm not even... I need to just not read it, because I... Yeah. I, I read the first, what, three parts of this. I read the... Just Enemy read it within number it. one and the Captain Marvel tie-in and then the previous Avengers Assemble tie-in and I just don't care. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm I'm willing to see it through. I just want to see what what they do with this if they really are trying to push Captain Marvel as 
the lead female character of the Marvel Universe, then, um, you know, I, I want to see how they execute this particular crossover and if they're able to establish her as that type of character. I'm hesitant to say that they're not going to do it. <laughs> I am not hesitant to say that they're not going to do it. <laughs> Cable and its force number 11. Nice little fun issue, mostly focusing on Domino and Boom Boom. You mean Thelma and Louise? Yes. Yeah. They uh, they have to rescue a, a new mutant before their powers activate. Yeah. There was one there was one panel in this I was not happy with when they basically melt off the middle of the Brooklyn Bridge. I took that personally. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Brooklyn. I did not like that. You I had know, no clue I, where they were at. I, I figured see, they were out on the west coast somewhere. No, if I see if I see Sal LaRocca at New York Comic Con, I'll bring that up. You're like, yo, man, I'm not. If the script brought this up, I'm going to take it up with the writer. I'm not happy. Uh, Deadpool 13. Anybody? Bueller? Nope. Fantastic Four number 10. Oh, I Easter. swore this off. I swore this off, but I still read it. it. I read it for academic review purposes. Traitor. How was and, it? Oh, uh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I typed my notes in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. So it's taken Fraction 10 issues to explain what the hell the Fantastic Four have been doing traveling through time and space. Why does it take 10 issues for Fraction to tell us? And why is it... It would have kept... It would have... It would have it, it, you know, like, if he if had just dropped a couple of hints... I'm sorry, Tim. Just uh, keep your, your, your thoughts for a second. If, if he'd been able to just tease out a couple of hints... Maybe readers like Tim and other people who dropped it because it didn't seem like it was going anywhere might have stayed on. Go ahead, Tim. So does he finally reveal it, this issue? He reveals what, you know, he reveals to a certain extent why they've been visiting the times and the places that they've been visiting and what Reed has been, you know, what kind of information Reed has been gathering. Basically, in this issue... The, the cat come you know the, the cat is out of the bag and they have to tell everyone on this little family field trip what is going on with their powers and they have to go back to believe it or not the Ameri the, the the start of the American Revolution and the signing of the Declaration of Independence because it is July and you know they have to deal with spoilers a scrawl who is impersonating Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin, oh. <laughs> yep, Benjamin Franklin. So, you know, basically, if you've been keeping, if you've been reading this series up until now, there's actually some, uh, some, some, some sense of, uh, there, there's definitely a bunch of reveals, let's put it that way, in this issue. And, you know, if it's enough to keep you reading, I don't know. It's enough for me, it's enough for me to keep reading it academically, but I don't think I would pick this up, uh, in individual format, I'd probably have to wait to see if it's worth picking up in a trade. To be perfectly honest, that's it's gone down but to that point. Does it explain things why everybody in ancient Rome spoke modern English, or not that? But that's actually uh, that's actually uh, touched upon at least that 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 particular time jump in FF number nine. If it's okay to jump to that. Is it okay? That almost has me curious to to read it. So Can I we'll jump see. to FF number nine? Go ahead. Yeah, I was okay. gonna say how, okay, how go come? Ahead. Hold on. I was gonna ask how come? Obviously, there was a a month miss because Fantastic Four ten is out, but FF number nine is out also. No, FF number nine came out a month after, if I'm not mistaken. Well, they may have they may have missed oh. an issue. I don't know. I thought they, I think they came out like the same month, at least they started the same month. Could be wrong. They may have missed an issue. Yeah. It, just just uh, as an aside, I don't know if you read this on one of the comic book news websites, but Mike Allred, the artist for FF, uh, had a break in in his house, and like a whole bunch of like computers oh, yeah. and stuff got got stolen, and some of his work, you know, like, I, I, my, my understanding was that some of it was backed up, but he definitely lost some of it, so if he is behind an issue, maybe that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, I've read, uh, yeah, I remember when that happened. Yeah, he and he, he and his wife, Laura, who, you know, they both worked together on this, so, um, that was like know, that might, so ago. exactly, that might, that might be a reason why they're, they're off by an issue, you know, between the two of them. But anyway, back to my all-caps review. 
more fraction finally developing a coherent story. Nine freaking issues into the story. Too many readers have left the book because it took too long to develop. And there's the touch upon uh, uh, the alien who was impersonating, who was basically acting as Julius Caesar back in ancient Rome. So uh, there's definitely movement in the FF storyline, although it's not movement in the uh, the arc where supposedly they're going to try to end Doctor Doom, but instead there's going to be some more time travel hijinks, this time on the FF's part. Again, seriously, you know, I, I say this in all seriousness, this is definitely trade-worthy stuff because I think this is long-form storytelling. It's just the month-to-month -month has been a grind, and it's not. I don't appreciate it. Don't appreciate it. I don't. Okay. It's a gong for me. Uh, I like, you know what's funny is that I like the issues. I just hate the fact that it took this long to get to this point. Iron Man number 13. More of the secret origin of Tony Stark, which I haven't read yet, but I will. I'm actually kind of enjoying that. Really? I tried to read it. I tried. Greg Land's background art, I see. At least his oh. name's on the cover, so I'm like, eh. It's, uh, it's awful. Mobius, Lure and Vampire number seven. Now, Classic's not here to uh, review that. Classic, along, we miss you. Moving along to its cast cancellation date. Uh, Nova number six. I reviewed that on uh, theclicknation.com. Might not re review another Nova book because not too many people are clicking that link, I see. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first issue of the new uh, creative team, right? Yeah. Who I, I like the new creative team. I right, like I didn't Paco mind. Medina's art and uh, Zeb Wales is nice. I didn't mind this issue so much. It was kind of interesting, although it definitely came off like an Ultimate Spider-Man type of issue. I like that. Uh, I like where it ended. So put it that way. I didn't mind it. Dirt, did you read it? You know, see see what nope. happens next issue, and of course the solicits for October. I know what we see what happens, but. So I'm definitely hyped for that. Uh, let's see. Get through these rest of the books. Savage Wolverine number seven was awesome. <laughs> did any of y'all read this? I did. No. I did. You're missing out. Like the I don't best. know. Dirt, are you a, are are you at all a Wolverine fan? Just out of curiosity. I was for several years. I was reading it, but. But um, like like I'm talking about like like mid early eighties, late eighties, something like that, because the brown and gold uh uniform just brings back floods of memory. You know, it, it floods me with memories of like kind of the good old days. So uh reading this it's definitely kind of harkens back to that time. Um there's definitely a nice twist at the end that Tim, you know, that, that I'm not gonna spoil here. I don't know if Tim's review got into it. I never oh, yeah, read it. look at it. Oh, no, yeah, no, I but I don't know if your review got to the got to the twist. I know, haven't reviewed it yet. I've been meaning to. Oh okay. So um, there's definitely a nice twist at the end, so it, it's interesting to see where this goes. But the the, the tone, the overall tone of this the story arc, is pretty cool. It's definitely reminiscent of the brown and gold days of Wolverine. I like the when Wolverine is about to fight whoever the big ninja guy, and the little blind guy's like, "Don't look him in the, you know, don't." Look, look! Don't stare him straight in his eyes. You're gonna provoke him. Blah, blah, no, blah, no, no, no! He's gonna follow you to the ends of yeah, the earth. Yeah, he'll follow you to the ends of the earth. He'll search for you and he'll pull your skin from your bones. Blah blah blah. And like the guys, like not even paying attention to Wolverine. And Wolverine like grabs some rock. The guys like, "What are you doing?" Wolverine throws the rock, hits the guy in the head. The guy turns around. and He's all like, you know, "Right, he's all mad." Rage. And Wolverine's like, and Wolverine looks at him. He's like. Hey, right here. <laughs> Let's go. That was kind of I fun. thought that was pretty good. So, like I said, it was definitely a fun read, and it was reminiscent of uh, uh, of, of a different time. So, um, I, I definitely like that. Yeah, I I'm not reading the the standalone Wolverine book, but uh, I'm reading Savage because it's just fun. No sure. continue. No, don't worry about continuity. Just read. Oh, yeah, I mean, they even put a blurb in at the beginning of the issue. Like, yeah, this happens a long time ago, so don't worry about it. Yeah, so let's see. Superior Carnage number one. It was all right. I mean, oh, you read it? Okay. I mean, I can't. It was Carnage in jail. He gets broken out by 
uh, some low level villain and stuff. And they stuff. know they know it's rising number four or five. I haven't read yet. Didn't read it either. Anybody? Bueller? Thor, God of Thunder number ten. This I did was read. awesome. This was yes. awesome. Thor is great under Dirt. Uh, if you, are you reading this? Jason Aaron. No, um, you should. Yeah, I know. I've, I don't. I've I, yeah, I don't. I, I say that with with little to no reservation. You guys were talking about it last month and and got my interest peaked on it. So I've got the issues uh, sitting there to read. Uh, just something I haven't gotten around to yet. Sure. He's done a good job because, like I said, the Marvel books I've read growing up were X Men and Spider Man. I never read Avengers books. I never read like the single hero books like Captain America or Iron Man or Thor. Never read any of those. Now I am. Iron Man's kind of eh. Captain America started out eh, but it looks like it's getting a little better. Especially with Rick Remender on there, so I have high hopes, but Thor is awesome. Yes, it is. No, it, it is absolutely one of those books that I love opening up to read when I get it. So, you know, the art, Eastside Ribbick's art is awesome. And the way this is being written is, you know, it's phenomenal. It's definitely reminiscent of the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Simonson, you know, like the long form uh, storytelling that Simonson put in when he first started and put, you know, and introduced Beta Ray Bill way, way back in the early '80s. And, yeah. um, you know, this is this has definitely been one of the highlights of my collecting in the last couple of years. And I met Isad Ribic at the New York Comic Con last year, and I saw some of the. Uh, the commissions that he was basically churning out within like a night or two uh, of the uh, of, you know of, of being hired to write or draw uh, a commission at the con and they were phenomenal. He works in watercolor and pencil and it's just beautiful stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I can't recommend this book enough. You have to read it from from jump and if this is something that you're gonna read in collective format, I think it will come off very well in collective format. Yeah, this will yeah definitely collection because it's been one from issue one to whatever this is ten. It's the same story. Yep. But uh, Thunderbolts number thirteen haven't read it, but I will. I gave Thunderbolts up, up, but since Charles Soleil is on new writer, I'll give it. I like the last issue, so we'll see if that continues. Phil Noto's well, he was on art, but uh, whoever the Steve Dillon is back on art, but I can put up with him if the writing's fine. Ultimate Comics Spider Man twenty five was awesome again. It was good. I liked it. More Miles Morales. Finally getting over a little bit of PTSD. Yeah. He's back in the game. Finally. Uncanny X Force number eight. I read it. It's kinda of fine. It's doing the whole cluster Phantom X. Weapon 8, Psylocke storyline, filling in the blanks of what happened at the end of Remender's Uncanny X-Force really? run. I and like, a, like a bad habit, but I, new I, one. I should read it for uh, academic purposes and see what you're talking about. Yeah, it, uh, the art is... Eh. I mean, it's, it's, it's not horrible, but it's kind of different, I'll put it that way. Gotcha. But as long as it changes once this arc story arc is done, I'll be happy. Okay. I'm I'm enjoying Cable and X Force more. Gotcha. Has anyone been reading What If AVX? I was reading the first one. I know the second one was out. So I will check that out. Yeah, I need to look. Dirt? No. No. I mean, I I don't I just didn't care enough about the main story to read a What If on it. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Wolverine Mats number nine. No, nope. haven't read any Matt series ever, so who no. knew? And X Factor number two fifty nine. I actually haven't read been this. Re- haven't been reading X Factor, but I read that just because I heard they revealed the Shadow Star, Shadow Star long shot connection. Yeah, yeah, and it's all which I thought they had already revealed that before, but right. I guess they changed it again. It's all a bunch of mumbo so. jumbo. <laughs> And since when? Okay, so I'm I'm way out the loop with Shadow Star. The only thing I know is him and Rick are lovers. I know that much. But when? Since when were his? Did he actually have powers, and they were teleportation powers? I don't know. How long has that been going on? I don't, you got me. But uh, yeah, I won't say we won't spoil what but their there connection is. It's in this book. Is, but it's kind of nice. I mean, it's the one that they've been 
put it this way, it's one that they've teased before, but there is a extra right. wrinkle. There's definitely, done this in is there. definitely a classic Claremont style hanging or dangling plot line that's finally been wrapped up. Um, <laughs> I definitely like that Peter David in this, you know, like basically in the uh, the death throes of this run of X Factor is tying up as many of these loose ends as possible. It's kind of nice. I'm like I'm going over it in my head again, and it's like, is that really what they did? Yeah, it is. So yeah, yeah. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, that's Marvel. And I haven't read any of these, but I just want to mention Valiant has Archer and Armstrong number eleven and Harbinger Wars number four, which is oh, the I'll finale see, right? of their events. Do you read any of those? Nope. Dang. I I read the first few issues of some of the Valiant books, and this Valiant universe is just not for me. Gotcha. And I'm actually getting into the Valiant universe now because I read last week's uh. So, Man of War, which is the new jumping on points, and then I read Quantum and Woody. And I'll be reading Eternal Warrior when it starts next month or whenever that is. And uh, Archer and Armstrong has a new story arc starting. Uh, I don't think it was this issue, but maybe next week. Secret Sect or something it's called, so I'll be checking that out. And we are past due time to be ending this. Sh- oh, actually, is that the issue? Huh, anyway. Yeah, I'm looking at the Archer and Armstrong cover that Dirt put up. I'll need to go back and see if that's the beginning of the new... Some four-part story, I think they said. But, I won't, oh, got one tweet tonight, just a second ago, from at Roddy Cat on Twitter. He says, I like how Thanos Rising is painting this intergalactic killer as a nose-open simp or the bottom of an MS relationship. See yeah, really makes, really makes him, <laughs> it really makes him look uh, threatening to see how much of a simp he was growing up. Mm-hmm. But he killed a bunch of ba- his own babies. That's right. Except for Gamora, apparently. She escaped. Yeah, I'm not... I enjoyed the first issue of Thanos Rising, but now I'm kind of just like... I'm waiting for it to end. Yeah, it seems like it's an issue too long now. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to end. I'm just waiting for to to see what, if anything, you know, is is all that different in this iteration or, or this particular telling of uh, Thanos' origin. So nice changing of colors you get there, Dirt. Did anybody read Watson and Holmes? No. No, sir. Uh, this is actually uh, a fun little book. It was, it's the story of Sherlock Holmes, but it's set in modern New York. And so you've got um, Watson, who is a former military guy, now working as a medical intern at a major hospital, and Holmes is just a, you know, small-time PI, basically. And uh, somebody comes into the emergency room, uh, you know, and they've been drugged and whatever, and Holmes comes in to, you know, ask some questions, and Watson is standing there watching and decides that he's a little too invested. He wants to find out what's going on, so they embark on this on this uh, journey, you know, through uh, New York City. And uh, it's one of those books that you can tell, like, the the artist and the writer both must live in New York City because there's a lot of landmarks in the background. And, you know, they're running across the Brooklyn Bridge and, you know, all this kind of stuff going on. And um, But, I mean, it's a a pretty good mystery. I've noticed um, this was a Kickstarter book, and they've got the first several issues available digitally, uh, this is the first one to make it to print through Diamond, but if you go online, you can actually get, uh, like, I think the first four issues digitally, and one of the things that they did is they've released the book this way, the way you currently see it, with the looks like a modern comic, you know, the coloring and whatever, but then they also released it in black and white with tones. So if you want to read it as, like, this noir, New York, hard-boiled type story, it's there, but then if you also want to read it kind of as the modern action, uh, you know, gunfight, whatever, it, it, like, it has a little bit of both to it, you know? So depending on what your interest is, it kind of works both ways. So I thought it was a really interesting book. I, I really enjoyed it. Okay. Cool. That would be a good ending point for us tonight. There you go, uh, our, non-superhero to comic, Ray, our non-superhero comic of the week. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in to tonight's episode of the Click Nation's Comic Book Chronicles. This is where Aiden came to I had to move my I had to move the mouse back. I had to move the mouse back. <laughs> uh, 
Check us out on theclicknation.com. And follow Dirt on Twitter at PCN underscore Dirt. And check out his website, popculturenetwork.com. Get that in there since we did our plugs earlier in the show. Get, get Dirt's in. So for Agent underscore 70, PCN underscore Dirt, I'm Tim DLGG98 on Twitter. This is the Comic Book Chronicles, and we are signing off. Classic material! <laughs> <laughs>